Uh, this is part two of our new series that we're calling Simplify. And as you know, we're trying to delete three words from the Crosspoint vocabulary. The three words are overwhelmed, overscheduled, and exhausted. You guys ready for this? Anybody tired here this morning? Yes, sir, I understand. Last week, we talked about how dangerous it is to allow yourself to get depleted. And you guys drew a line on the bucket. You remember the, the Kids Point handout that I gave you last week? It looked like a little coloring chart. But uh, you, you drew a line on the bucket to inter- indicate where that you're at in your life, whether you're depleted, you're a quarter full, half full, three quarters full, or completely full. We said when our buckets are completely full, full of God and, and healthy relationships and physical energy and, and all of that stuff, that you make your best decisions, uh, you pray your best prayers, you, you love your family the best, you're good with God and you're good with everything in the world. When your bucket is empty, you're dangerous. When your bucket is empty, you are dangerous. When you're depleted, it's not good for you and it's not good for the people in your life that love you. Okay? Yes, you pay a price, but so does everyone that's close to you that you care about. That is a fact, my friend. That's a fact of life. So we have to take responsibility and tap into streams of replenishment, whether spiritual, relational, or recreational. We have to take responsibility for refilling our buckets so we can live full lives rather than depleted lives. Last week, it took me 40 minutes to explain that. Today, I did it in three I don't know how it happened, but it just did. This week, I want to focus on one word. The word is overscheduled. Everybody say it with me. Overscheduled. Why? Why are we talking about that at church? You see, an overscheduled calendar can cause anxiety. It can cause stress. It can put strain on relationships. It can cause you to be late for important meetings and events. And again, I'll talk about this later on in the message because some people are still coming in. (laughs) Don't want them to miss it. Now, some of you are a bit worried because you want your church focused on uh, what you would consider far more substantial things that relates to your spiritual life. You know, more important than how we arrange our day. But listen to me, okay? What if I told you the Bible has a lot to say about our daily and weekly calendar? In fact, it's one of the holiest endeavors that you can and should focus your attention on as a Jesus follower. Ephesians 5 verses 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise men and women, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, I believe when you sit down to rewrite your schedule, you're making choices with far greater implications than most people in the room or watching online could possibly ever imagine. And what if I told you drafting a new weekly schedule or monthly schedule is equivalent to writing a whole new future script for the next season of your life? What if I told you that your calendar plays a critical role in determining who you're going to become as a person, as a Jesus follower, as a family member, as a friend? I believe all that and more, and I'd like to frame today's message around one penetrating question that brings conviction to me, okay? And here's the question. What would your schedule look like if God were in charge of it? I've given a a lot of thought to this question. Honestly, mine would change quite a bit. Last year, I studied Jesus' schedule, his daily, weekly, and monthly schedule. Very interesting, and we'll get to that in this series, but... In preparation for this sermon, I read some articles about great world leaders in our history. Did you know that Winston Churchill worked from his bed? Uh, he, would, he would wake up at 7 a.m. every morning. He'd work from bed till about noon on most days. Leonardo da Vinci would take two-hour naps whenever he got tired. Uh, he didn't want to waste an entire eight-hour block of time during the night uh, so, you know, sleeping. So he scheduled two-hour naps throughout the course of a 24-hour day. Now, I understand some of you like that, and I see some of you are starting that two-hour nap right now. I'm going to ask you to hang in there with me and start it after I get through, okay? A lot of people who have led interesting lives throughout history, they did so with very uh, strange schedules. And here's the thing. They experimented with their schedules until they found a formula that really worked for them. 
They didn't have to have a, a schedule that looked like everybody else's schedule. Uh, they had strong individualization that said, uh, I don't have to conform to any societal standard or any uh, kind of pressure or etiquette. They basically decided, my schedule has got to work for me. Which brings me to this question. Is your schedule, is your current schedule working for you? Okay? Is it really? So let me come right out and tell you where I'm at at this stage of my life regarding uh, the schedule. You know, all this schedule stuff. Here's the, here's the big thing for me. And this is why I'm bringing this message to you today. I'm learning that my schedule is far less about what I have to get done and more about who I want to become. Most people I talk to use Google Calendar or another calendar app of some kind to map out their schedule and they set reminders, you know, uh, do all that kind of stuff to make sure DSS doesn't come and take their children because they forgot to pick them up from soccer practice or some ball field, whatever. Uh, most of us start with the list. And here's the thing. Most of us start with the list of what we feel we have to get done, those imperatives, those things that we just must get done, what we'd be in trouble for if we forget about it or if we neglect it. We list all the have-tos, and when we get the whole list done, we grit our teeth. You know, we've checked that box, whether it's a daily schedule, a weekly schedule, a monthly schedule, and after we check all those boxes, we say, God, help me pull this off for another week, another day, another month, whatever that it's going to take. And I think most people in the room and watching online understand what I'm talking about. Amen? It's just an overwhelming thing. I put my schedule together like that when our family first moved to Fayetteville way back in 2000. I was the pastor of a growing church, the chief administrator of a Christian school and a very large daycare. I had 72 employees under my direct supervision. So I probably would still be kind of just, you know, looking at the most important things because there was so much stuff that had to get done. And I'd probably be putting my schedules together the same way if it wasn't for a little girl in middle school named Marissa who owned my heart but could not get on my calendar back in those days. She couldn't get any quality time with her pop. Now, she was a daddy's girl from the time she was born. During that stretch of our lives, I'd, I'd often go... Uh, four or five days and never lay eyes on my children. I'd get up and leave well before they got up to go get ready for school. And then I was coming home at night much later than what they were staying up. So I was missing them for entire uh, weeks and stretches like that. Um, and so it was a challenge. One evening I had to rush home to clean up for another meeting. And uh, there was, you know, three boards. There was a daycare board, a school board, church board, and there was all-time board meetings. And uh, I just, you know, it was an overwhelming environment. But one evening, I rushed home to clean up for another one of those meetings. And I was in my room. We lived out at Arlington Plantation. Uh, and that's out there on Kentucky Lane. Did I remember that right? And um, I'm in the room getting ready, had the door cracked. And I heard Marissa and her mother in the uh, other room talking. And Marissa goes, is Daddy going to be gone again tonight? And Sylvia said, yeah, baby, he's got another meeting. But, Mama, we haven't been together all week, and this was like a Friday night. So Marissa started speaking out. You know, she does that. She has a tendency to do that. Uh, more and more, she was expressing her frustration that I was never home. Uh, she was in middle school back in those days, and those words, is Daddy going to be gone again, started echoing in my ears. And I suddenly realized that I had acclimated to a schedule that had very little, if any, time left for my family. So I started asking questions like, why am I going to be away from my wife and my kids again tonight? Well, the answer was easy. There was stuff on my calendar that had become a higher priority. Easy answer, hard to confess. That had become a higher priority. I had let this happen. I had allowed it to happen. And because of Marissa's constant prodding, I started to ask myself, should my weekly schedule include non-work responsibilities? Or asked another way, how inclusive or holistic should my schedule actually be? Should it, should it only be work stuff or should it be more inclusive than that? So I started asking, am I looking at this whole thing from the right perspective or not? Have I got this messed up or am I doing it right? And then the gut-wrenching reality sunk in when I asked myself, how much do I involve God in prayer and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit when I'm sitting down mapping out my schedule for the month? Or am I just cranking out more work, trying to cram more in to get more stuff done and more boxes checked? My calendar dysfunction went on for years. 
As I mentioned last Sunday, even after we left that denominational church, that school and that daycare in the rearview mirror, things didn't get better right away when we started this church. In fact, it got a whole lot worse, and it took an awkward intervention that we talked about last week to help me get on the right path. I'd hit a wall, but that wall was a wake-up call for me, and it was a wake-up call for how I was interacting or, or the lack of interaction with my own family. I had to answer some tough questions like, what investment of time will it take for me to be a better-than-average dad to my kids so that they won't end up with failed relationships in their future when they're out of my house? What's that going to look like? I figured that out, and of course, it changed as the kids got older, okay? But I was determined that I wasn't going to lose my influence because I was an absent father who lived in the same house but never gave quality time to my family. I changed my schedule. Now, I used to journal in a day planner back in those days, and I pulled up some of those old files this week. Does anybody remember three-and-a-half-inch floppies? <laughs> Deja vu. Here we are. All of my stuff, and these things won't hold, they won't hold much, okay? But this one's got the word journal written on it, so I found it. And uh, Jeremy Davis, who used to attend our church years ago, he brought me a three and a half inch floppy uh, adapter with a USB because he heard me complain that all these new computers had gotten away from three and a half floppies, and that's all I had. <laughs> and he hands me this thing, he said, Pastor, you need to catch up. I have since caught up, okay? Uh, but back in those days, it was three and a half inch floppy. So this one's got the word journal wrote on it. So I, I plugged it into that adapter that Jeremy gave me. And, um, and I went all the way back to 2005 and 2006 and looked, started reading my daily inputs and entries and journaling. And by reading those entries and, and just kind of following along on the calendar, I could literally see when my life shifted when, when my schedule changed and my family was added back to my schedule, all of a sudden, after years of working late and never being at home, there were in, entries almost daily that said things like home for family night or home for family dinner or home for movie night. Home became a common theme in my entries. Now, when I started reading that journal, I felt the Holy Spirit say, this is when you started getting it right and started making up for all that lost ground. And I had lost a lot of ground with my family and I'd lost a lot of influence. And I told you last Sunday, I, I felt like I had lost the respect of my children. And that awkward intervention, that's what basically they said to me. And when I wrote those words on that page, the near supernatural power of, of, of a schedule gripped me fully for the first time. I believe, and you, you can disagree, and okay, I know this is an uncomfortable sermon for a lot of people in the room. I get it. And I understand it's going to be quiet, so I'm prepared for you to be quiet. Don't bother me a bit. Okay? I believe my kid's future was impacted when I started writing the word home on my daily planning journal. I honestly believe that. I sincerely believe my decision to do that, it, it brought about generational implications that became very positive instead of very negative. It was a, a head-popping moment for me about the power of calendar commitments. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an awakening like that, but when I started adding entries to my day planner that said home for whatever reason, it was a big deal. And the positive implications for my family, I'm telling you, I cannot overstate that standing here today. At this point in my message, there are two questions I'll throw out there. One is the wrong question to ask, and the other one is the right question to ask, okay? Here's the wrong question. What do you want to get done in the next 30 days? Here's the right question. Who do you want to become in the next season of your life? Amen. A pastor friend recently shared the story of a church member that was his close friend. He said they were very close friends. And he said he was in a, his buddy was in a dead-end job, couldn't bear the thought of grinding out decade after decade in this job that he absolutely hated and detested, and it wasn't a very good-paying job. So one afternoon, he got home from work. He went to his computer, and he looked at a, a community college calendar, and he saw there was a night class in the field that he dreamed he might someday go into. He said that he signed up for that class, which would require a Tuesday night commitment for two years. He puts it on his calendar, and he tells his family about it. 104 Tuesday nights later, he gets a professional degree. He changes his job, has a fulfilling career, and today his testimony is, is that he's comfortably retired. Uh, his whole life changed when he wrote night class 
on his calendar every Tuesday for two years. Now, you probably recognize the name John Grisham. Anybody ever read one of his books? John Grisham? Anybody? Amen. It's okay to raise your hand, okay? I'm Pentecostal. You don't scare me when you say amen or when you raise your hand or nod your head like a duck eating corn. I'm good with all that, okay? But John Grisham was the novelist who sold well over 300 million books. Well, John is a dedicated Jesus follower. Did you know that? He's a dedicated Jesus follower, very involved in his church, and he's very involved in contributing and supporting a lot of nonprofits throughout the world. People that work closely with John say that he is an absolutely phenomenal man of great integrity and character. Now, here's what you may not know about John Grisham. He was an attorney. He hated his job. He wanted to become an author, but he didn't know how to do that, so he just started getting up 60 minutes earlier every day of his life. And he said, I, I'm going to get to my desk for 60 minutes before work, and I'm going to write one page a day before I walk out the front door. As a result of that calendar commitment, he, he eventually became one of the most prolific and appreciated novelists of our day. That's the power of a word that's written on a calendar and lived out. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. A few years ago, I had a young man. This was powerful, and I honestly had forgot this story. I don't think I've ever shared it until first service today, but I had a young man approach me right over here. We didn't have a baptistry here. We used to roll a baptistry in over here, and everybody stepped off the stage down into the... Anybody here for those days? A lot of you. You remember that. Uh, but, you know, this young man approached me one Sunday morning over on this side of the stage, and with a distraught voice but a sincere, sincere heart, he told me that he didn't know if Christianity was true, and he was just very honest about it, and he had an open mind, but... But he said, I have a lot of questions. So I thought, you know, he's, he's asking a lot of questions, and, and, and the few minutes that we have together right now is not going to take care of it for him. So this is what I did. I, I told him, I said, look, do you have a calendar on your smartphone? And he pulled his smartphone out. He said, yeah, I, I use, you know, Google Calendar. I said, great. Uh, so he got it out, and I said, pick a night on your calendar. Starting this week, pick a night, any night, click on that. And I want you to block off 45 minutes a week on the same night every week for the next six weeks. It, it, it can be, you know, before you go to bed, or you can, you can block this out early in the morning before you get up to go to work. But I want you to give it 45 minutes a day for six weeks. He said, okay. And he's tapping his phone, and he's, you know, getting all this ready. And I said, now on that date, if it's Tuesday night, and you're going to do it every Tuesday night, uh, I said, I want you to type in these words, a recurring event. These words, the wrong God, the wrong God. And he's like, okay, PT, what does that mean? And I said, look, I want you to go to our YouTube channel and type those words in, and there's going to be six sermons that's going to pop up beginning in August of 2017. And I said, every week for six weeks at the same time, I want you to sit down, whatever time you choose, and I want you to sit down, and I want you to watch that sermon series. And it's about 40 minutes a week because the questions you have raised today, I don't have time to do it just to stand in here talking, but I deal with everything you're, you're concerned about in that series. And I told him, this is going to be so good that you're going to want, want to watch all of them in one night, but don't do that. I said, I need you to watch one a week and then let it simmer in your spirit for a week and let it sink in and let it, you know, let it just uh, cultivate in your spirit and in your soul. And then the next week, you pick up the next one and commit to six weeks for that. And then he looked at me, he's kind of nodding his head, and I, and I asked him the question, I said, will you promise me right now that you'll do that? Will you, will you make that commitment for the next six weeks? And he said, yes, sir. I said, awesome, awesome. And I honestly tell you, I, I walked away from that, and I didn't check up on him, I didn't follow through. The next time I saw that young man was when he was stepping off the stage over here on this side to get in that baptismal pool to get baptized as a new believer going public with his faith. I believe that he kept that calendar commitment. Six messages entered it in. The wrong God. Eternity changed, life changed, family changed. And they PCSed out of here, and I lost track with them. But man, what a powerful, powerful thing to make a calendar commitment. What could it possibly mean? Last weekend, I had a lot of conversations after that message. Uh, people liked the bucket thing and how we ended, and they liked learning about the dangers of depletion and what it feels like to be replenished and to start filling your bucket back up. But a few people actually came and said this to me. And look, I'm not trying to be hard. I'm just a plain-spoken person, and I love you more than you know, okay? So I ain't trying to hurt nobody. I'm trying to help somebody, okay? 
But a few people actually said to me, I almost didn't come today, PT. Man, I'm so glad that I came. But I was lying in my bed thinking, should I go get up and get ready or am I going to stay home? Maybe, maybe not. I almost didn't come. And I would have felt so bad had I missed being in the room and experiencing this. And feel, You remember we, we had a great big prayer at the end and everybody was pressed towards the front and the Holy Spirit filled the room and so many people's hearts and lives were impacted by what God did in the room. Not necessarily what I had to say, but God showed up here last week in a powerful way. Man, it was powerful and it was strong. And I have to be honest with you, when, when uh, I heard that more than one time, I almost didn't come. I, 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 had, you know, I started thinking, you know, with all that's going on in the world and with the increasing rate of Bible prophecy being fulfilled right now, when people say I almost didn't come, I don't, I don't say anything ugly back, but I, I'm thinking in my mind, Really? You don't have church on your regular calendar. You're flipping coins on Sunday morning about whether or not to together with your faith community for corporate worship. This, this isn't a, a calendar commitment for you. It's not already penciled in as a recurring event every week. I like how the Gospels reported about Jesus. Luke 4, 16 says, And on the Sabbath, Jesus went to the worship gathering as was his custom. It was on his calendar. He went every week. It was there. Who do you want to become? And I'm asking that question. If you have even the vaguest interest in becoming a more spirit-filled up Jesus follower, someone who knows a little bit more, feels a little bit more deeply, has a little bit more uh, direction in your life, there are a couple of things that you, you ought to have on your calendar that's recurring. Gathering for cor corporate worship should be one of them, folks. It just should. Your life changes when you reorder your calendar. You start by asking, who do I want to become? We have a couple of guys in this church, more than a few, but, but two that I know of that were vocal about this. And uh, they used to complain about being in bad shape to the point of, you know, they felt like they were very unhealthy. And I noticed about the same season of life both of these guys started making drastic changes. And, you know, over the last couple of years, just a major transformation, complete and total transitions from unhealthy lifestyles to uh, peak physical fitness. Very impressive what they were doing. And I followed their social media progress as they were going through all this stuff. And, and here's what I picked up. Whenever people would, would ask them the question, hey, how did you do this? How did you do this? What's your secret? Their answer was the same. It took a daily commitment of time they had to put it on their calendar i had to get up an hour earlier i had to go to lunch go to lunch instead of going to lunch i'd go to the gym i mean it was a daily commitment in other words it was a calendar commitment the power of words on a calendar will change who you become we'll, we'll soon announce dates for financial peace university that's going to be hosted right here on this campus on sunday afternoons Based on conversations I've had with so many people in the room and so many people watching online, I know that there's a lot of people that call this their home church and you've never experienced a peaceful relationship with your money in your life. You grew up in a family of financial chaos. Uh, then you went to school, racked up a bunch of debt. Then you bought a house. Then you got married. You married a wife or a husband uh, who's got their own ideas about money. And then there was this tug of war thing, you know. And now both of you are trying to make it. And some of you have only known financial anxiety your whole life because of all this pressure. I had a young middle-aged man during the peak of the pandemic. He came to me and he said, Pastor... I can't make it in this environment. Man, I, I run my own business. My business was booming, and now I'm in trouble. I can't get the work that I need. I'm thinking about giving up my house and letting the bank come and, and take my tools and my equipment and just getting a fresh start and maybe starting all over. And I was like, man, don't do that. Don't do that. I've been right where you are. Don't do that. Don't you dare give up. Hold on. God will make a way. There are other things that we can do to adjust your lifestyle. Let's, I, I told him this, I said, let's make a list. Me and you sit down and do it together. Let's list all the non-essential things. And let's, let's list the essential things. And I said, I guarantee you, when you give up your house, you're going to have to go find another one. Right? So let's just call that essential. Housing is something that's essential. So let's put that over here. What's not essential? Oh, here comes the pushback. Everybody's going to moan. You don't, I said, you don't need showtime. You don't need Cinemax. 
You don't need HBO. You don't even need Netflix. We went on down the list, and we're talking about things that he did every day. I said, you telling me you stop at Starbucks every morning? Oh, yeah, I'm going there. You stop at Starbucks every morning and pay $7 for a cup of coffee? Let's add that up. I bet you can keep your house because Starbucks. And somebody said, oh, my God, he did not say that. I sure did. I sure said it. You know why? Because a lot of you, about 200 of you, participated in our annual Daniel Fast and gave up Starbucks for 21 days. Now, you wouldn't fun to be around. I give you that, okay? You were ornery people and a little bit edgy, but you found out it was a non-essential. It was not an essential thing. There's, and I said, look, let's just reorder your life. Let's restructure this. Let's do some Dave Ramsey-type teaching here. We plan to announce a date for Financial Peace University very soon. I'm working with Rachel Connor on this because some of you have never known financial peace. When we give you some dates for those nine sessions, you need to get out your smartphone and you need to write the initials FPU on your calendar, Financial Peace University. Make it a calendar commitment. It's going to take about 90 minutes a week for nine weeks right here in this room. And this course, let me tell you something before you push away from this. This course has rescued tens of thousands of families who were in financial dysfunction. And it has brought them financial peace. And again, ask yourself this question. Who do I want to become? If your answer is someone who isn't stressed about money and I want financial peace in my life, then you need to make this calendar commitment, okay? Put it on your calendar and then do it. Some of you are thinking, hold on, P.T., you're, you're making it sound magical, like anything we just block out on our calendar is just going to happen just because we wrote it down. A few years ago, I had a couple in my office for marriage counseling. They're no longer here. Um, I did the initial session, and I quickly realized that they needed professional Christian marriage counselor because I'm listening to them, and some of the things they were saying, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm such an in-depth counselor. I'm like, don't do that. Stop it. Just stop, you know? That's my counseling. How stupid is that? Don't do that. (laughs) So I realized I needed somebody that could really help them that was called in this area of ministry. And I knew also that they didn't have the resources to pay for it. So I said, look, you guys need a counselor to save this marriage. You need a good Christian counselor. And we have one that is in partnership with our church. And uh, they've helped. This lady has helped a whole lot of couples at our church. Would you be willing to go to counseling for six one-hour sessions? Let's just start with that, and we'll pay for it on our dime, okay? And, 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 you know, let's heal some of this hurt that's in your relationship. And they both pushed back, okay? And they said to me, at this point, I don't think anything's going to help us, PT. And I said, listen, there are children involved here. There are children involved here. You're about to blow their lives up with this news, okay? Please don't do that right now. Do this first. Do this first. So begrudgingly, they said, yeah, okay, well, we'll do that. And I gave them a voucher and helped them get connected with a really great counselor. And they went two times and quit. And then they got divorced. That was not a happy ending, was it? It doesn't always. And, you know, would it it have made a difference If they had gone all six times, you know what I wish? And I'll say this about that. I wish they would have hung in there for at least those six sessions. Because I think families are worth fighting for. And I think kids are worth fighting for. Some of the happiest couples I know. Let me talk about this. And I know there's tension when I'm talking about these things. But I'm telling you, I've talked to divorced couples in our church that have uh, divorced and then remarried and divorced, remarried. and, 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 you know, it's just a painful thing. And I've said, look, I don't mean to offend you when I get up and talk about being in a marriage relationship committed for life. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. Because if I'm sitting where you're at, I want to preach your life like me standing up here talking to your children saying, when you get married, plan on doing it for life. Because couples that separate and couples that stay together, it's not that couples that stay together have less problems than couples that separate. It's that sometimes they have more resolve to hang in there and just keep fighting for that family. Because I believe families and, and, and children are worth fighting for. And, and I get it. Look, I know there's some that, golly, you've done everything you could do. You've hung in there for years and years and years, and, and you've just been absolutely miserable. I know that sometimes you're going to reach a point where you've done everything that you could do, 
and I'm not here to beat you up. I, I'll support you in whatever uh, door God opens for you. But I just believe families are worth fighting for, and I think those kids are worth fighting for. But again, some of the happiest couples that I know have made a, a calendar commitment called date night. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. It's one, one night every week, and, and they don't let anything get in their way. They want to always be happily married. So they make a calendar commitment. They don't flip a coin. They don't wait to see if everything else gets done before. They want to become increasingly happily married, so they put it on the calendar and they protect that night. Who do you want to become? Who do you want to become? Sylvia and I work together every day. Now, some of you couldn't pull this off. We have worked together every day for years. I haven't run her off yet. <laughs> and she can't get rid of me. If she leaves, I'm going with her. I'm just telling you. We have regular date nights. We love old school shows on Netflix and dinner together and talking about our day and talking bad about our kids when they don't come around enough. <laughs> Netflix and constant conversation, guys, that's a cheap date. I get romantic just thinking about it. <laughs> cheap date. Boy, I ain't even kidding. Almost free, okay? <laughs> I remember the night. <laughs> I remember, the, I got a feeling I'm going to spend some money on Sylvia this week. <laughs> but I remember the night I made a decision to become a Jesus follower. I was 15 years old when I truly embraced faith and became a new man in Christ or a new boy in Christ. I'd lived in a pastor's home my whole life. My dad was a phenomenal pastor, but until I was 15, I never really embraced an all-out faith commitment and became a Jesus follower until then. But at 15, my whole life changed. Uh, that's when I memorized my first Bible verse that actually impacted my life. And I memorized it in the King James Version because my dad didn't allow an NIV in his, in his house, okay? So it was all King James Version. Uh, but here's that scripture, Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But I didn't want to just memorize a scripture anymore. I'd memorized many scriptures before, but they didn't penetrate my heart or my soul. I wanted to live it. I wanted to live it. And when I memorized that scripture after truly embracing faith, I started thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I actually going to do this? How will I put God's kingdom and God's righteousness first in my life? And here I am just, just a couple of years after that decision I made at 15 years old. And I'm still working out the implications of a God-first lifestyle, okay? But I can say with great confidence, it began with a calendar commitment. Redraft your schedule and seek God first with your time on your calendar. Some of you are thinking, PT, you don't get it. You just don't get it. I run a business that dominates my days and controls my calendar. It's a non-negotiable for me. Listen, we all have things that we have to do. I understand that. We all have things that we just have to do. I get that, but listen to me and don't miss what I'm fixing to say. If you put the God stuff on your calendar first... And then fill in around that. You'll most likely become that kind of person. I decided years ago that I wanted to become a God first person in every area of my life. Listen, it's never too late to reorder your calendar and to put God first in your life. Y'all okay out there? Do you, do you have any idea what my homework assignment for you is going to be this week? I'm going to ask you, there you go, I'm going to ask every single one of you sometime this week to sit down and draft a God-first schedule on your calendar. 30 days. Do it for 30 days. Some things need to be recurring, so that's easy, okay? A seek ye first kingdom of God schedule. If I were you, and I'm a Jesus follower, okay, there's two things that I'd make sure that I put on there that are recurring, and they would be non-negotiables. I would not flip a coin to decide whether or not I was going to follow through with this. I'd write two things on there first. And there's some flexibility on this first one. Daily 15-minute devotions. 
Maybe you want to do 20 or 30 minutes. Maybe you can only squeeze in five. Or maybe you want to get up an extra 30 minutes early or stay up an extra 30 minutes late after the kids go to bed. However, it, it works out for you. But you need a daily time alone with God, just you and God. Get you a good devotional. Now, there's a great Bible app, version. And they've got phenomenal devotions. And Glenn shared one with me this morning. Where you at, Glenn? You, you texted it to me. Thank you, sir. I've already taken a quick look at that. Great material. Man, what a great daily devotional. There's all kind of stuff out there to help you to get into a good 15-minute devotion every day. Second thing that every Jesus follower that says they love God ought to do is follow his example. Follow his example. Weekly corporate worship or church and then fill in around those two things. Just fill in around it. Those two things should be recurring. One weekly at least and one daily. Amen. And then fill in around it. And I promise you this. Now, I know some of you don't like what I'm preaching. I don't give a royal rip. <laughs> you need to hear it. And I need to say it. Amen. Sometimes it's not, it's not all gravy. Sometimes there's, you know, there's, it's a little bit hard. And again, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. Because I want you to succeed, and I want your families to be blessed, and I want you to, to soar. But I promise you, you do this, and you live this out, and that bucket, wherever you drew that line at last week on that little coloring sheet, I promise you, if you do those two things, and then you fill in around your spiritual directive for your life, that bucket's going to start getting full. It's going to start going from depleted to a quarter or a half or three quarters or eventually full. And it's going to impact. It's going to have generational implications in your life. I promise you, start by asking, who do I want to become, not what do I want to get done? And then schedule those plans, engagements, relationships, activities that will lead you down the path of who you want to become and the kind of person you want to be. Some of us, look, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. Some of us are out of shape. Hard to preach this sermon this morning. Some of us are out of shape, overweight. Please, join me. And penciling in or typing into your Google Calendar, work out, work out, work out. Some of you need to schedule 15-minute devotions every day before leaving for work or getting the kids up and getting them ready for school. Some of you need to schedule Financial Peace University on Sunday evenings for nine weeks. Some of you need to schedule and write this down, home, home, home. You just need to be home when your kids are young. You need to be home more. I, again, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to realize that we've got a lot of junk on our calendar that are non-essential things. It doesn't have any eternal value. And just as sure as I'm standing here, it happens. I've been in this thing for 38 years as a pastor. It never fails. I've, I've watched a lot of your children grow up from the time that I've dedicated some kids that are now in squad. I've dedicated them to the Lord in, in baby ceremonies. And it never fails. I've seen it seasonal and seasonal that parents, after 20 years of, of being a part of this ministry, will come to me and say, Preacher, I, ain't, I cannot get my kids to come to church. I can't get them interested in church. And I want so bad to get them to come back to church, but they show no sign of being interested at all. And I'm thinking back. I'm going, you know, there was a lot of non-essential stuff that you filled your calendar up with, and none of it had a spiritual directive. It was okay to just let your kids go and do everything else, but you didn't pencil in some imperatives. You didn't pencil in the essentials, that spiritual growth and development. And I promise you, there's going to come a day, folks, and, and get mad at me if you want to, but there's going to come a day. If you don't make a decision now and make it a priority to pencil in those imperatives and, and decide that you're going to have something on there to give me. To, you're, if I had a teenager, there ain't no way in the world I'd let them live their life without showing up at this church on Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8.30. I'd get, a, they don't want to come. They don't want to go to school either. And you make them go to school. You drop them off and tell them I'll be, hey, we ain't letting them leave once you drop them off. We got security here. They ain't going nowhere. Just drop them off. We'll take care of them for two hours. You know what will happen? They're going to learn to love it. They're going to learn to love it. They're going to be around kids their age that are leaning into faith. Josh has got 20 student volunteers that are stepping up. These kids are getting closer and closer to God, and your kids need it because the next season of their life, 
Those professors are going to stand up in those classrooms and they're going to tell them there is no God and all this is a figment of your imagination. You better get them rooted and grounded in the Word because the world is not their friend. You keep putting all that calendar crap on there that ain't got no eternal value. And you're going to lose this generation, I'm telling you. Now, I'm not, if you're a first-time guest, I'm usually a lot nicer than this when I <laughs> preach, okay? Just so you know. Some of you are, are in dead-end vocations, and all you do is complain about it. You need to write night class on your calendar. Do something that will eventually get your life on track. Listen, honestly, God knows my heart. I love this church, and that means I love the people, not the building. I love this church, and you're not going to become someone fundamentally different than you are right now unless you make some calendar commitments and live them out. Get this right, folks. You only get one chance. It's incredible how fast the seasons of our children come and go. You got little small children today, and they're grown tomorrow, and they're off, and they're gone, and they're running and doing their own thing. Instill in them faith that is undeniable, that will carry them through the toughest seasons of their life, and we're trying to help you do it. Take advantage of it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father God, Lord, I know the dissenting opinions, Lord, and that there's a lot of pushback when I preach a sermon like this, and this is only the second time in my ministry that I've ever talked about people being overscheduled, and I'm ashamed to admit that. And some people would say it's not relevant, but I think it has everything to do with where we are and the mess we're in today. And I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you'll bring conviction into this room and to the people that are watching online, whether they're driving down the road in a car or whether they're in their living room at home. What, wherever our folks are at, God, would you bring conviction into our hearts to help us realize that calendar commitments mean everything and we need to make a list, an individual list of non-essentials and essential things. And we need to put those essential things on first. That spiritual directive, Lord, we've got to pencil those things in. And, and it's not a flip of the coin. It's a commitment. Lord, family time, being home with our family in those influential years. Lord, I almost lost my children. They didn't even want part of my, my religion. They were done with, with me and had no respect for my faith because I wasn't living it out at home, the, what I preached in the pulpit. I almost lost my own kids. And God, there's a lot of people that's in the same mess. And I pray in Jesus' name, God, that they'll not walk out of here and forget what we've talked about here today. This has eternal value, and it's the most important thing that we've talked about so far this year. And Christian folk, Jesus followers, need to get this thing right. Help us to do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Would you stand all over the room?